All right, good morning. Well, this morning as we look at uh, the theme of why, I'm going to tie it into the uh, relationship with uh, one another at Hosanna and just the body of Christ. But the, uh, the first question is why do we have hope? Why do we hope? Just that simple. Why do we hope? Uh, the world is just filled with hopeless despair. I mean, so much so that uh, there's thousands and thousands of people that take uh, medication because of their anxiety, their hopelessness. There are as many or more that uh, try to drink it away or use drugs, and they don't even necessarily know that that's why but they do it uh, in desperation of trying to make some sense of what's going on in their head. They turn on the news, and uh, every other or almost every single one of the news reports is some kind of violence. I mean, there's 300-plus million people in, in the United States plus the 700 or 7 billion plus, almost 8 billion people on the planet. And so there's plenty of bad news, but um, they focus on that. And so by the time you get done with a half an hour of news, the world's falling apart. And everybody's shooting everybody. Uh, and everybody's uh, uh, reckless and so on. It's uh, uh, tiring in many ways. But then when it hits home and it affects your life, whether it's in uh, the loss of a loved one or uh, a divorce or a financial issue or a bankruptcy or uh, somebody who has uh, kind of stabbed you in the back or uh, turned against you or gossiped about you or something on the job that you know is wrong and you can't fix it and if you try you get fired for it and just on and on. I mean there's, there's so many things that can just bring us to a place of hopeless despair. And outside of Christ uh, there isn't anything to hope in because eventually whether it's a government or an institution or a resource, uh, we see with the fires now over 100,000 people are without their homes. Uh, and if I heard one interview with a guy and he said, we don't drive nice cars, uh, we don't have an expensive lifestyle, but we poured everything into this home. And then he turned around and looked at the ashes and all you could see was the fireplace. Uh, just, you know, some things that uh, have so much importance in our life, outside of life, but it can go and it leaves us, you know, with a, a sense of now what? Uh, and yet God has put in us this need for hope. And uh, babies know it. They, they respond to how often they're fed and they, they start to look forward to when they're, get, when they're gonna get fed and who's gonna hug them. And without hope, they just literally shrivel up and die. That we are wired for that. Biblical hope essentially means assured promise. It's when faith has been activated in our life, we have an assurance. It's like meeting somebody every day at 3 o'clock, and so you say, okay, I hope to see you tomorrow. And what you're really saying is, I'll see you tomorrow. Because it's happened so often, so continuously, that there's a hope and assurance of it repeating. But the world's hope is vain, empty, and uh, um, hurtful. Why do we believe things will always get better is a simple way of putting why do we hope? Uh, why do we have that? The Bible says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The evidence. Faith is the evidence. Faith is the substance. It's, it's, it's more real than the material things. And uh, as a former atheist, I mean, I had problems with that. Well, I don't get that. And yet we have the concept, the reality, the depth of it, the emotion of love. We can't see it. 
We can't contain it. We can't quantify it. But it's there. And when it's expressed, whether it's joy, love, or uh, peace that passes all understanding, we have a hard time finding words to really express what that means in, um, in relating to somebody else or telling somebody else what's really happening. And hope is a lot like that. But we know it's there, and we know we desperately need it. When we don't, it's called despair, it's called anxiety, it's called clinical depression if it gets bad enough. And people that really get hopeless because of whatever's going on in their brain, whether it's chemical or whatever that brings them to that place, and sometimes it's just bad news after bad news after bad news, that you get somebody who, uh, like Robin Williams, that uh, just got everything together seemingly and all of that and then hangs himself. You know, that they can get such a despair that there's uh, this activity of, I'm done with it, and suicide. And it all comes down to, well, why not? There's no hope. I don't see anything in the future that's of uh, any reason for me to stick around. That's pretty desperate. And yet we're wired for hope. So when hope, hope isn't there, it's devastating. But what we're hoping in is the real issue. Hope, faith, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. And that's where the rub is, isn't it? Because we don't see it. But prophecy, for instance, in the Bible, it's not so much to tell us about what's going to happen because we figure it out by the time it happens. There's all these other things that have happened that we go, oh, I didn't see that there, you know, and how it works out. But when we look back on prophecy fulfilled, we go, wow, I can trust God's word. When we see it work in our own lives, when we see it, the activity of our faith uh, in Jesus Christ being blessed and answered prayer and so on, our hope is built up. It's encouraged. It, it brings us to a, uh, a place that no matter what else is going on in the world around us, we have hope. But some people just fight with that. So the body of Christ gets around and says, come on, well, you know, it's okay. You know, believe God. Go ahead and apply for that job or do this again or try that again. Or, uh, you know, just for the first time, just step out in faith and do it. And it's like, no, no, I don't. Here's, here's kind of a video that explains that, I think, in a very vivid way. Uh, way uh, that <laughs> uh, what happens when people just don't want, even though they see other people trusting, uh, they just can't do it. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, sympathy works. It's like all these people, we laugh, they see the dog go, no. <laughs> How could you do that? Anyway. But uh, faith, 
is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, you know. We don't see it, but there's evidence there that it's okay. But when we, uh, when it, it's such an ethereal thing in some ways that we can see through it and it's like, I don't know, I can step out on faith and believe God. But we need to encourage one another sometimes uh, <laughs> reluctantly uh, for people to be able to step out. Uh, hope is a gift, though. It's a gift of God. Um, as I said, hopelessness uh, brings despair, depression, anxiety. Uh, but to have it is a, is a gift, but you have to exercise it. Uh, you have to s decide, choose, I'm going to believe God over what the world says. I'm going to believe his word over what the world says. I'm going to believe his purpose, his plan is going to be final and absolute. And that's what I'm going to trust in, not the world system, where the world says, well, there's no absolutes. There's no real truth. Well, then what you just said has no validity. You know, they've got no ground to stand on, but they just, oh, it's all okay. Well, it's not. There is truth and there is lie. There is good and there is evil. And there is a beginning. The scientists have now figured that out, and the Bible's been there for centuries, they're saying that. And there will be an end. And he describes exactly what that will be at the second coming of Christ and what will happen and all of that. And in the meantime, we're living it. We have a day-to-day -day life that tells us to trust in him with our our personal lives, our, um, our intimate lives, uh, what will be the outcome if we violate God's rules and God's laws, our financial lives, our single lives, our married lives, our uh, integrity, all of that are just serving God. And now he promises to bless us, bless if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. But to take that step and say, God, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to believe you. And... Um, and take that step of faith. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's standing up to a coworker or whatever and saying, you know, what you're doing is wrong. It's deceitful. And, um, and I don't care what else happens, but uh, this has got to be dealt with. And we see this with the Weinstein thing, you know, and all this nonsense about him. And finally, the ladies are standing up and encouraged by one another to speak the truth and to deal with it in an industry that is just rampant with that, and, uh, and they point their finger at everybody, and look what you're doing, and look what you're doing, and here behind the scenes, they've got all this trash going on. And um, to be able to speak out uh, sometimes is, is a step of faith, and uh, especially when it comes to something where God says, look at know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Just, just do what's right in, uh, in the sight of the Lord. And um, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, because it really starts with this in the sense of our relationship to the Lord and how this unfolds. And then I want to look to you for some answers and some examples, if you will. In chapter 10 of Hebrews, um, he says, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. In other words, sacrificing to, to, uh, to fulfill the law or even the atonement for the law during the Old Testament uh, is not enough. For then uh, would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. So every year they would offer sacrifices, and the fact that they had to offer them reminded them that they needed to. Just that simple. But the answer, the fulfillment of those sacrifices was in Christ. So in verse 10, it says, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So our hope, in other words, is not in fulfilling the law. I'm finally good enough to be good enough. I'm finally in a place with God that I, that I, that I can attain to some fo form of perfection. And when it isn't perfect, what happens? Other people get blamed or 
there's this rumination that goes on inside which brings despair and sorrow because we're not perfect. But when we're forgiven in Christ and we can go forward, we can do it with joy and, and hilarity and, and refreshment. So when we fall, we say, Lord, forgive me. We don't do it intentionally, but when we do, we know that, that we're not condemned over it because there's no condemnation of those that are in Christ. And so our hope isn't in ourselves. I'm not hoping that I'll do all these great, wonderful things and do them perfectly. My hope is in Christ. And he doesn't let me down. When our hope is in ourselves or in other people to be perfect, it fails. Even in the hope that they had as they would offer sacrifice yearly for their sins, every year they were reminded that they're still sinners. Our hope is in Christ to sin once and for all. Our sin is forgiven once and for all in Christ because of his offering. And so then when we just confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. But we don't have to live in the bondage of it because we know we're forgiven for the past, present, and the future. In verse 19, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness, the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. To stir us up to kind of walk out on that glass (laughs) bridge to get us where we need to go. But trust in the Lord. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, which is what churches are about, what Hosanna is about. As is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hosanna uh, and the celebration of what God has given us is, um, is really about hope, hope fulfilled in Christ, hope accomplished in relationship to the Lord and looking forward to. Um, we do it through prayer and through relationship of walking with the Lord. We have these these things that were the tracks that are in there that just, you know, pray for us and says Sunday what to pray for all the way through Saturday and, and uh, just day by day and just reminding us that it's not us, it's just it's coming to the Lord for these things. But what's happened in relationship to the Lord when it comes to hope fulfilled has taken place in each one of our lives to one degree or another. In other words, it's, it, it's not comparing ourselves with ourselves, but the, the degree of, of how much has been trusted or entrusted for the hope to be fulfilled. Uh, I'll give you an example. Brad Dacus, who is uh, the head of Pacific uh, Justice Institute, I did an interview with him and Dan Wooding for um, um, Windows on the World on Hosanna or on... Um, a Holy Spirit Broadcasting uh, Network and uh, TV. And um, it was quite interesting. He shared his testimony. He's been here before. We're going to have him back in January, I think, to share. But uh, he loved the Lord at 16 years old. He'd given his Lord, life to the Lord as a young child. Um, he's driving his car down the street, and a motorcycle comes up over the hill, ran straight into him right through the window, and uh, took the left side of his face and just crushed it. And uh, for him to live was, was a miracle in the first place. And uh, the guy on the motorcycle flew over the top after the bike went through, and he, uh, by God's grace, survived. But Brad's face was just totally on the left side, mangled, and his brain. And so they... Uh, you can see him today, even there's just some anomalies there in his eye socket, but they rebuilt the whole thing. He got his sight back. They said the doctor basically he can remember being in, in a coma state, but hearing them and they're saying, hey, chances are he's not going to be able to see again. And uh, since that's the left 
side of his brain where the logic is and math and, and all of those kind of uh, practical matters. There's so much of life he is not going to be able to, to accomplish and to do uh, the artistic side and, and some of that and maybe songs and things like that. He'll be a remember possibly and so things. But uh, as far as living his life out uh, with what he needs from the left side of the brain is just not there. They cut a hole in his skull and his brain literally was coming out of his skull because of the swelling. And they said, there's just so much damage, don't expect uh, much of anything, uh, especially any measurable IQ. And um, he heard that and his thought was, God, I'm not going to listen to them. I'm going to hope in you. You know, you, you can do it. All things are possible. I, I'm going to just trust you and I'm going to do whatever. And... Um, he did just that, and step by step, day by day, they said he wouldn't be able to speak, and he spoke. They wouldn't be able to do this and, you know, do math and logic and everything else. Um, became an attorney, uh, wanted to serve God as an attorney, created Pacific Justice Institute where they, they do all their cases for free for religious uh, uh, institutions, especially for churches or individuals. You have a problem with a school district or something, and you can't pray in school or share Jesus or whatever. They go to, you know, to right to the head of it and deal with it um, and do it all for free. And God has blessed him abundantly. <clears throat> but his his testimony really is a testimony of hope and uh, just. God, no matter what the outcome, I'm going to hope in you, not in what the doctors say. And um, so it was interesting because one doctor, he went back to him years later and he's, he's you know, he's an attorney and, and uh, graduated in the top of his class in a very prestigious law school and all of that. And the doctor said, well, all I can say is you must have been a genius before. And the irony is, he said, well, Actually, just before the accident, he took an IQ test, and he said it was 140, and he said it's now 140. <laughs> so uh, he said, I'm just exactly where I was when it happened. And uh, just hoping in God, not in, um, in himself or the doctors or, or anything else, but God's promises and God's word. And I know that's happened with so many others, and we talked a little about this on, the, on Wednesday night, but just asking people in the body, what, what has happened with you? You know, what has God done in your life? And to keep it short, but to the point, and uh, I, uh, I was just so blessed a couple of Wednesday nights ago we did this, some of the testimonies, just uh, some of the things, you go, really, that, you know, that's where you came from, that's what happened? And uh, you know my testimony, so I'm not going to go over that, but just the uh, I know you play the you play the harmonica and everything else, and uh, you're a healthy, fit guy. You look like you've been in church all your life. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, well, uh, in February. Yeah, go ahead and stand up. Okay. In February of 1996, at 39, am I on? Is this on? Yeah. Okay, you're hearing me. In February of 1996, I was 39 years old, and I was about ready to turn 40, and I was uh, so strung out on drugs and and my alcoholism that uh, I cried out to God, curled up in a ball to kill me because I was done living. I just had no hope, none whatsoever. And uh, I know God heard my cry because he killed, he began killing the old me. And it's been 21 years and he's restored me pretty much so. Uh, emphysema, at, it was used to be very moderate and it's kind of mild now compared to where it was because I quit smoking, quit dro using drugs. But uh, more importantly, he gave me the peace that, Pastor Grace said that peace that passes all understanding, that I have that comfort in knowing that I have a hope of eternal life in Christ. So uh, all that despair and hopelessness out the window, and praise the Lord for that. Amen? Amen. There we go. There we go. <laughs> okay, somebody else? Um, I had a brother that committed suicide when he was 19 years old. And uh, when I was about uh, 35, I went through a clinical depression. I spent 18 days in the hospital. And that was right after I was saved. But when I got saved, 
it was like a lot of guilt came out and all this stuff and uh and it and it hurt bad and yeah. I you know I went through the depression but uh yeah God has done everything yeah. for me yeah. since then that so family yeah. and everything yeah. Yeah. so yeah that's neat that's sweet somebody else Hello, everyone. My name is Sean Struhl. Uh, long story short, uh, I have a twin brother, three long-lost sisters. I grew up in the foster system, was adopted at 15, have two DUIs, domestic violence, uh, been in a lot of trouble. I haven't had a drink in the last six months. I'm doing good, and God is good. So everybody has a story. Um, just got to stay strong, hang in there. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'm just so grateful to God for Gary. He has such a gift of word of knowledge. My brother was recently diagnosed with brain cancer. So just to hear this, I'm just asking you for his for prayer for a miracle healing because we're not going to the doctors. Uh, it was pretty much inoperable. It gave him nine months. So I appreciate your prayers. His name's Sam. Okay, Lord, we lift up Sam and we pray for a miracle, Lord. We know that, does he know the Lord? We know he'll be with the Lord in Jesus' name no matter what, but we pray for a healing of God's hand to touch him and deliver him and cure him in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. I had a little boy named Jimmy we prayed for years ago that uh, my wife was there with me and uh, John Atkinson from uh, Calvary Long Beach and his wife Sally and uh, the doctor had actually walked out of there, pronounced him dead, signed the death certificate, left. And uh, we were reading, reading Psalms and uh, got to Psalms um, 5. Um, uh, and then Psalms 22. And uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, Psalms 5 is, Lord, in the morning I'll, I'll cry out to you, which the father read that. And it was, we're just passing him around, the Psalms. And when she got to Psalms 22, and she said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? She's broken in tears and crying. And uh, it was interesting because she said, God, I'm so mad at you, you know, but I, I know there's a reason. And the moment she kind of expressed, you know, God forgive me and everything else, um, Jimmy sat up and he said, can I have ice cream? Mm. And uh, he was a uh, seven or eight or nine or something like that. And I, th I think he went to be with the Lord when he was 17. But they gave him all that extra time and... and um, uh, you, know, you just don't, I mean, the, the doctor didn't even know he was alive until he got back the next day, you know. But you just, you know, they, they do their best, but the reality is God is a great physician. I, t I too am a twin, and um, the other day my sister was coming home through Lambs Canyon to go back to Banning, and her brakes completely went out. Um, they had just done the brake pads two days before, and luckily, she was able to get to the side of the road. But um, she was going down about 70. And uh, when I heard it, twins have kind of a thing, you know? <laughs> and so um, and she, when she was in this 18-car pileup, I knew something was wrong. And this time, I knew something was wrong. But in addition, congratulations. I have 31 years of sobriety. Keep going. Don't you love that? I mean, you go around the room and say, you, you you were drunk? <laughs> I mean, you know, I know, I'm serious. You would never, you, you know, you look around and if, if you knew everybody's story, it'd blow your mind. You go, oh, everybody's got their act, act together but me. Well, trust me, you're in good company. Somebody raised their hand over here. There we go. Uh, good morning. Um, I teach fifth grade in Compton, and uh, recently a very uh, angry hurting little boy has been placed in my classroom because he's not doing very well with the other teachers. Uh, his father is not in his life, and his mother describes him as a, a bad boy. And so um, I've been praying to the Lord because I knew this was going to be difficult uh, to give him strength and me hope and faith that things will work out. And, um, well, things have been going very well for the last, uh, last two weeks. So I just pray for little Reggie that he will see that things can be good. Good. All right, God bless you. I have a daughter who is 38 now, and we went through 20 years of ups and downs of drug abuse with her. And it was very painful, but somebody in the body gave me the scripture that he, began, he who began a good work in you 
will be faithful to complete it. And I'm having trouble. Well, the last two years, she's been walking with the Lord, mm. completely sober. I clung to that verse for 20 years. Every time I felt hopeless, I said, God, I saw you begin the good work, and I trust you to finish it. Yeah. And he has. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I was vacuuming the floor, and I heard a voice, check your breast. And I just continued to vacuum. And I hear this voice, check your breast. So I went, this is not how I received the Lord as my Savior, but what he did for me. So I went, and I checked my breast, and I felt a lump. And I went to the doctor, and it ended up, it was cancer. And just that God talked to me, because a lot of women have breast cancer, and God didn't tell them, and how fortunate I was yeah. that God told me to check my breast. Yeah. And he, I just felt his presence. It was close to like 10 months from start to finish from surgery, chemo, radiation treatment. But God was just with me every step of the way that I never feared because I knew he was with me. I was able to, I would walk to my chemo appointments and then my husband would pick me up at the end of the day, but it's like, no, you don't need to go with me. God is with me. And it was like, God and I are going to do this. Mm -hmm. And he was just with me the whole, the whole yeah, way. Yeah. And I was just, and how are you and doing? I'm so I'm thankful sure and are, blessed. And people probably, how are you doing now? So far, it's been eight years, okay. and as far as I know, I'm doing fine. Great. All right. God bless you. Come on. Okay. Just uh, as I'm going over here, how many people, just raise your hand, have at one point gone through a very severe depression? Look around. You're not alone. It is one of the tools that the devil uses in our lives to bring us to despair and to, to destroy what God wants to build up. So put your hope, put your trust in God if you're going through that right now because he can get you through it, out of it. Hello. I want to say that um, within the past 10 years, I've experienced many very close losses and during those losses, I've grown to know the Lord more and more each time. Now, I know that through those losses, we feel the pain and everything, but we also know that he's carrying us through it. And those, that was my will for me. And that's, my, that's what he was there for me. And each one of them was more just, I can't explain it, but you know what? He was there. And he gave me the hope that when I go, now my hope is, oh, gosh, I cannot wait to see you. Not that I want to go, but I just can't wait to see you, you know, because this life is just going to pass by. We're going to have problems. Can you say, he, when you say losses, can you say what that means? Oh, um, it started with my mother, my brother, my sister, and uh, a really good friend, couple good friends, husband, and they were all different, so therefore I was, he put me through each one of them in a different trial, and I seen it. But at the very end, he got me where he's like, okay, now I've got your attention more and more. And that's when I realized, wow. Oh, and I forgot a dog, too, you know. Um, <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> You're talking about the, the, that they all passed. They all passed, yes. yeah. And, um, and that's what it is. When you have that, you have the hope that you're going to see them again because you know where they're going, and you, that's the hope. Because first you see Jesus, and then you see them, and it's like, wow, you know what? I'm happy. I don't care about these problems, but you know what? I have hope at the end of the, at the, end of the day, at the end of my life. And I know we all have trials and stuff, but you know what? We have to hope every day that, you know what? He's our... He's our reward. He is our reward. 
And that's what carries me through all that. Because, yeah, you know, you get depressed and stuff. But when you start praying and meditating on his word and his promise, he is there. And he will lift you up. And that's my story. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Good morning. Um, my name is Rodney Smith. And life has been like a roller coaster ride. Right? I've had good days and bad days. And even now, after working all my life and raising kids, I still have valleys that I go through. And what I want to say this morning is that the hope that I receive through faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has turned into strength. And that strength is what I use to keep going back to work. Right, to keep giving relationships a second chance, right, to keep forgiving people. So my hope has turned into fuel. Mm -hmm. Even when I don't feel like getting up, it's the hope of the blessings that he's promised that keep me going. Even when I don't feel like being nice, his hope <laughs> instills me yeah. to be nice. Yeah. That's all I want to share yeah. this morning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. My name is Kenny, and if it's okay, I just wanted to share a couple verses um, about trials. So in James chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Anyway, I just wanted to, I was reading this recently in Colossians 1.23 and Matthew 13. It's all kind of correlated, but basically God blesses those who continue in the faith. That's Colossians 1.23. And so a lot, a lot of what's being talked about is trials, people being, you know, it says right here, uh, trials produce steadfastness, loyalty. And so God just somehow loves and and honors the, or somehow blesses the. How did, how did you get saved, though? How did I get saved? Yeah. <clears throat> I was not raised in church in 2008. I somehow, just sounds random, didn't know any scripture, didn't know anything about Jesus, nothing. I just dropped on my knees and started apologizing for my sins. And then I asked um, God, just, I just want to be right with God somehow. Mm -hmm. And then within less than a week, fast forwarding all the minor details, Someone shared the gospel with me. And it was a Wednesday night in 2008. It was about an hour-long conversation. I just, I prayed with this man. I don't remember all the details, but I know that I was basically going through the Romans road. Uh -huh. And um, I just started bawling. Not that that's necessary, but I started crying. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I was born again right then and there. Yeah, yeah. And fruit cool. came instantly. That's neat. Thank you. Thanks for the scriptures. Uh, about 25 years ago, I was saved, and about two years after, my life continued to cave, cave, drugs, all that. So I got to this point after I was a Christian, about two years after I was a Christian, I failed at marriage. I failed at my job. I failed at being an unbeliever. I failed at being a Christian. I failed at everything. I failed at life. It was time to die. There was no point. So I, picked, I was laying in the dark in my room, just crying at, at God, saying, what's the point? I'm a failure. So I pictured a bridge, a nice tall bridge over a freeway. If the fall didn't kill me, then the cars would. So I, that's it. It's time to go. So I went to get up, and he put his hand right on my chest. He didn't say a word. He just, so I, I could move my limbs, but I couldn't get up. And so I said, okay, Lord, fine. I won't kill myself. And from then on, I just trusted him. And that was homeless, useless. Now I've got a job. He's completely restored me. But there's a one verse that, that there's this verse in the psalm that says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? I will put my hope in God and the help of his presence. The fact that he's present is why there's hope for me. And the when he put his hand on my chest, he let me know he was present. So there's plenty of more trials, plenty more that equal that kind. But depression is not an option because he's present. So that's how I got through it, yeah. through his help. Well, thank you. 
Is, uh, you don't see, uh, I think he was here second service. There was a fellow here last week who, a drug dealer in town, and he's part of the Hells Angels from years ago, went through the Vietnam War and all of that stuff. And he, um, he woke up Sunday morning, <clears throat> and he, he, his wife had died in August. And so he was mad at God and everything else. And, and, uh, but he woke up, and he felt like the guy down the street doesn't know Jesus. The person across the street, this person doesn't know Jesus. And I thought, i got to tell him about Jesus. Now, he hasn't been living for the Lord. He came to Hosanna years and years ago, and I knew him from that. But uh, he was a dealer and everything else. And so he uh, uh, I said, Lord, what am I going to do? The Lord says, tell him you're through. So he called the people he works with and where he gets his drugs and everything else. He's got cocaine all under his bed. And um, he called him. He says, I'm done. I'm through. And um, they said, no, you're not. And he said, yeah, that's it. I am out of it. And they said, well, get yourself a body bag. And he said, well, you're going to have to come through Jesus because that's who I belong to now. And uh, hung up. And then a short time after that, he started getting tremors, you know, and he was just his hands were shaking off the cocaine. And, and uh, so, you know, normally he'd take some more. And he started shaking. And the reason you bring it up is because what you said. And uh, he just said, Lord, I need your help. And he put his hand out. And the Lord reached out and just grabbed his hand and just held on to him. And he said, just as peace that passed all understanding. And so he came in church Sunday. He was here service uh, last Sunday. And you, you met him, Ken. And uh, and he just, with a sparkle in his eye, and a, you could tell he was just cleansed, you know. And uh, God just said, no, I'm with you, you know. And he just meets us where our need is, whatever that need is at the time. Anyway, anybody else? Any one phrase. I am so grateful. I am just so grateful to my Lord and Savior. Many years ago, before I met this blessing of a man who came in my life, I went through a depression, a serious depression. Uh, I was at the end of my first marriage, and I was hurting. I was hurting bad. And uh, I devised a plan to end my life. I devised a plan. And uh, I was tired of hurting. And I remember sitting up there telling God, and says, I'm tired of hurting. You know, I have no more will. Even the, the children, my kids, wouldn't give me the will to live. And they, uh, that made me feel even more depressed because mm. them in my life didn't give me that will. So I devised, I had a minor condition called hypoglycemic and I was going to um, literally stop eating and let the results of the hypoglycemia take over, which basically you end up in a coma and you don't wake up from it. And that was my plan. I was going to do that. And uh, um, no job, uh, no income, no new place I was I moved in and uh, it was just too much for me and remembering my childhood very <laughs> traumatic <laughs> childhood and I said this is just too much I can't handle this and when I said those words I cannot handle this I told God, you have to take over because I can't handle this. And one point at a time, it wasn't like oh, all at once everything just came up clear and bright and hope-filled. But he gave me inklings of hope. 
one point at a time. And over a week's time, my despair, wanting to end my life, wanting to everything within a week's time, God just took over. And unbeknownst to me, God was going to put this man in my life. Because I think about that now. If I would have been successful in doing what I was thinking about doing, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have this man. I wouldn't have this beautiful lady who took me in, made me her daughter-in-law, and loved me just the way I was. And I've got, how many grandkids do we have? We got 13. 14. 14. We got 14 <laughs> grandkids. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't have had that. Yeah. I work downtown Los Angeles. I work in a, you know, got my own office, yeah. window, <laughs> overlooking God the hills. knows what you need. <laughs> but if I would have yeah. had my way. So I'm grateful. Yeah. Yeah. You see how God works independently. I mean, one person, he touches it right away. Another, you know, over a period of a week, sometimes months, a year. But he brings that hope. Anybody else? Uh, my name's Harry. Most of you know me. You know, I'm a really happy guy. But uh, when I was 12, I used to be, you know, in the partying scene with all the people, and they did drugs and drinking. Thankfully, I uh, never have. God bless for that. But um, I had a friend who was uh, dealt with depression with cutting, and uh, we went out to a party, and I lost track of him during it, you know, and I was just hanging out. And then I heard some screaming, and I ran over. And uh, he had mixed a few drugs together, and he had cut his wrist wide open, and he basically he bled out in my arms, my best friend at the time. <laughs> and so you know, I lost him there. And uh, I went through depression for quite a while. And then two years later, the market crashed and everybody lost their homes and we got evicted from our house. And I lived on the street for the next seven years, going through the rest of high school, you know, back of a pickup truck with my parents, my dog and myself. You know, God brought me through all that. And um, I remember one day I had just I had enough. I, I was done. And 34 people, 34 people that I knew, whether they were drug dealers, did drugs, drank, smoked, didn't matter what it was, you know, they did it, they had it. Well, either they didn't answer or they just didn't, you know, have anything on them at the time. And I remember thinking to myself, what, what are the odds? What are, what's the chances of this? You know, I went through that whole day depressed and sad and just, you know, wondering why. Well, I had uh, been brought to Ozano at that time, and it wasn't until I finally went to a uh, summer camp that I finally got saved. But uh, the following day, more than half of them had recontacted me, asking if I still wanted to do some drugs, smoke, drink, and I, w I was good. God had given me peace, you know, led me through it. And... Um, I finally got, went to college, got back on my feet, you know, started living uh, with Pastor Nathan at Young Adult's house. And um, I can look back and see where he, he got me through it, you know. It still, still saddens me, but, you know, at least I know that he's with me. I have hope looking towards the future. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Well, to keep it short and quick, um, I got saved through a miracle. Um, I had a, a, a Bible that was given to me at a church camp when I was in eighth grade and um, got saved, you know, at every, every altar call at church camp as a kid because I thought that's what you're supposed to do. And then didn't walk with the Lord through my entire high school experience and was, uh, you know, drugs and everything you could possibly do. 
And about 10 years later, uh, my brother was going to that same church, went to that same church camp, happened to be bored one day and rifled through the lost and found boxes, and he found this little red Bible that said, um, presented to Nathan Hamry inside of it. And my brother thought, my, or my brother was like, my brother hasn't been to this camp in 10 years, so he brought the Bible home and he threw it at me and was like, dude, look what I found. And I opened it up and quite honestly, I was just like, this sat in lost and found at a church camp for 10 years. And out of 3,000 kids at this camp, my brother happens to be the one rifling through the lost and found box out of sheer boredom. And, and that started a process of, of me, you know, kind of uh, believing in the supernatural, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I ended up coming to the Lord shortly after that. And um, God's done some amazing things since. I mean, I've, I had in 2004, I was in severe clinical depression and uh, I had a suicide plan and, and I was going to kill myself. And I was one moment from walking out the door to go do it. And a friend of mine who at the time, very uh, uh, irritatingly happy and full of joy, pops <laughs> through the door and is like, hey, bro, let's go to the car show. And I was literally about to walk out the door to go do what I was going to do. And God saved my life there. And since then, I'm, um, I've had Lord's healed me of sicknesses and stuff. I was, when I went to the Sudan, um, I was in the country for three days and got malaria. And they were like, well, it usually takes two weeks to get it. And you got it in three days. And I was like, well, okay, well, I'm here to teach the chaplains. So, so I was laid up and they took me and I got drugs. And then they go, well, it usually takes, you know, two to three weeks for the drugs to kick in. And three days later, I was completely healed and ready to start teaching the chaplains again. And, and I mean, the last thing, just a, a handful of years back, I had a, a cancer scare, went to the doctor for something and they cut something out of me and they were like, this growth is way too big to be in a person of your age. And they checked it out and they said, well, it's precancerous and you need to go into surgery to get the other stuff out. And um, went into surgery and when I came out, I asked the surgeon, "How? what happened? How'd it go? And he goes, it was great. He goes, we didn't do anything. And I go, what are you talking about? You didn't do anything. He goes, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, no, they, they, they cut this significant mass out of me. He goes, no, you don't understand. There's, there's no scar. There's nothing there. <laughs> he goes, there was nothing to do surgery on. And so, um, you know, having these experiences with the Lord, you know, my hope now is um, I'm not really afraid of getting sick or because yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know God's going to take care of yeah, it, you know. Yeah. And, and in the darkest time of my life in the midst of this depression, you know, it's just like, I, you know, I, I don't ever have to worry about how bad it gets because I know God's going to, bring that, that at the time, annoying friend through the door yeah. right in the moment to just break what you're thinking and, and, and yeah. save your life. So, yeah. Praise the yeah. Lord. How about Good morning. My name is Jennifer Elam. I don't have a story about getting saved. I was always raised in the Lord and always believed. I joined this church in 2002. I walked down front and said I wanted to be baptized and join and just really make a conscious call, uh, answer call of the Lord in my life to be in Christ. And I did that in my, my older son at the time, he was 12, he followed me and he did the same thing. But I have a story about how God supernaturally did something in my life and my younger son's life to, to confirm that he is still with me because I was discouraged at the time being in the Lord for a few years and he wanted to encourage me. I didn't have money to buy my son's shoes. He had holes in his shoes going to school for like a month with holes in the bottom of his shoes. And um, we, um, I determined to study uh, one, one command of Christ a week with him. And it just so happened that command was have faith, what Pastor Gary's talking about today, have faith and hope. Have faith and doubt not. And it's in Matthew, I forget the exact verse, but it says when Jesus said to this fig, you shall also do what I did to this fig tree when he, he told the fig tree to die and wither and never 
produce any more fruit, you shall also be able to say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and it shall be done. Therefore, whatsoever ye ask in faith, believing, and whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, again, faith, what Pastor Gary is talking about, ye shall receive. That's the second verse behind that. And I went to sleep that night. I didn't think about it anymore. We got up the next morning. We, I told my son we're going to go and buy him shoes that next day. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I only had $15 in my pocket. Lo and behold, out comes this man, like, frantically looking around, and, and he's just, like, wondering. He, I mean, he looks like he's wondering and looking around for somebody. And we're arguing in the car, and I'm just kind of glancing at this guy, and he comes toward our car. And I roll down. He, he knocks on the window. I roll down the window. He said, does he need shoes? Does he want shoes? I said, yes. <laughs> and he, how did you know he, he wants, well, I saw him come in, and, and then uh, God told me to buy him shoes. And I turned to give my daughter, who was a toddler um, at the time, he, he turned to give his daughter to his wife, and when he turned around, the boy wasn't there anymore. Which was, which was my son, and he said, and th this, is, this is the boy that walked out, and I just, and, and, I, and God told me to come out and find him, and, and I just wondered, does he need shoes? I said, and I just broke down. I said, yes, he does need shoes, and he doesn't want the shoes that I can buy for $15, so if, if you buy him shoes, I mean, you would answer our, my prayer, our prayer. And he did. And he came back out with the shoes he wanted. And from that point on, those shoes have served other kids who needed shoes. His best friend had needed shoes. And I was able to get him another pair a few months later. And he shared those same shoes with his friend who his mother couldn't buy him shoes. So those shoes have been blessed and blessing other other kids who needed shoes. It's a miracle that, yeah, that those shoes fun. don't yeah. have holes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Thank, it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and that that pastor, I mean, that guy was a pastor from a church, yeah. and he, he said yeah. God told him to buy him shoes. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Mine's very short and small. A lot of people know who my dad is. Oh, A lot of people know who my dad is. I'm Rick and Christiana's oldest. Um, I have a daughter named Skyly, who is my world, and I know that it's supposed to be about family and loved ones, and picnic day is a perfect example. I get to take my daughter's brother to the church picnic today, and we got him signed up for Awana's because it took me, she's six, so maybe the last like four years, his mom and I don't get along. We did not like each other. It was a lot of hostility and anger and all kinds of stuff. So I just kept praying. I was like, please, please, please let her like me or put up with me long enough for us to enjoy him. So she went about a year without talking to us. So his birthday came around in February of this year, and I waited till probably the end of the day. And I called my daughter's dad, and I said, please, I don't care how she feels. I don't care if she doesn't like me. Just give me her phone number so I can let her call him. And he's like, all right, that's fine. So then I ended up talking for like 10, 15 minutes, and she's like, I want to call him tomorrow. And I was like, okay, let's pray about that one too. I sat there, and I prayed, and I said, one day I'll be able to leave with him in my car and not have to worry about it, and she'll just let me take him. And I say maybe like June-ish, 
from February to June, we prayed about it. She asked, and she kept asking and asking. And then one day, he wanted to go with us to go swimming. And she has three other kids, so she was like, I can't. I'm not going to make it. I was like, well, I could take him with me without you. And I just, like, closed my eyes, like, oh, please. And she's like, you know what? That sounds awesome. So the more I prayed about it, she was super hesitant at first, but the more I prayed about it, I was like, please let him be able to come with us more and more. So right now I don't work on Sundays, and it's about three months in. He comes to church with us every Sunday. We signed him up for Awanas, and I get to have him, like, a weekly visit. So I'm super excited, and I hope it gets better from there. Yeah. But knowing how horrible of a situation her and I were in in the beginning and just praying and hoping that he was going to do it and take care of it and make everything better. It gives you a lightness on your shoulders. Not necessarily that you're going to be upset if he doesn't answer it, but it gives you just a little bit extra when you're thinking about the horrible stuff or the bad stuff. So the faith and the hope is a good thing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Johnny. Most of you guys know my story. Some of you guys don't. Um, but this is how my salvation came to be. As a kid, I didn't really have a biological family. They were bouncing me and my sister around pretty much to anybody and everybody they could. Finally, my like 80-something-year-old grandma got us, and she uh, she was pretty old, so they couldn't take care of us. They threw us in the foster care system, and... Uh, me and my sister were separated for a pretty good long few years, and then obviously I was always in trouble. So the first time I met my parents, I was told by the foster family, which was a Jehovah Witness family, no Christmas, no birthdays, no celebrating anything. And uh, I was told, some new people are coming to take you. Hopefully they do. Yeah, well, when they walked in, I was doing standards for stealing a Spider-Man book from school. <laughs> it had pictures in it. I liked it. And... Uh, as soon as they walked in, I didn't hesitate to jump from the table and go, that's my mom and dad. I knew it right then and there. And I think we had one of the fastest adoptions in like the state's history. I think it was within three days. Three days, was it? I was with my family. Then my sister came a few months later. But I was, may have called them mom and dad, but I didn't trust that they would keep me until... My dad mentioned a story a few months ago. I hurt my brother Alex. Of course, he was a bully, but I loved him. I threw a coffee can, which had an edge cut into it, and it hit my brother in the side of the head riding away on his bike and just shot blood everywhere. Uh, by the time my dad found me, I was hiding where the pool machine was, and he said, what are you doing? And he came at me pretty angry, but then when I told him, are you going to send me back? He couldn't even be angry no more. He just goes... No, no, you're not in trouble. Just don't throw anything again. But uh, constantly throughout many years, being 18, getting in trouble for some pretty serious things, uh, he never turned his back, even to this day. Uh, I'm now a father myself, learning to get to know my nine-year-old son, and he having him there has been a major blessing because I wouldn't even, I'm pretty sure I was heading to, to like a children's home. Um, nobody could handle me. Uh, ADHD, bipolar, alcohol fetal syndrome. I was just a raging maniac. Um, but what is it, like 25 years now? Like 23? 23 years later, my dad's still helping me in every which way. But uh, <laughs> but he's getting me to a point to where I'm going to be able to have custody of my son and hopefully be able to uh, have him grow up with my nephews and everybody else at Hosanna so that he could have a part. Right now, my little brother who has grown up in Hosanna is, has not been with me for a few years. He's struggling right now with a lot of the things that the teens are going through. Um, I wish he could be here so I could have him around everybody, but when he's 18, we're hoping to get him back over here. So if you guys could pray for him too, because uh, he's, he's my little baby brother too. So as much as I could be an influence for them, I'm, I'm trying. But he's giving me the strength. For <laughs> Hi, my name is Casey. Um, I've always believed in God. He revealed himself to me when I was very young. And uh, the thing was, is I didn't know the things of the Bible. And uh, my relationship with the Lord was that uh, I, 
my fear of the Lord was the wrath of God was upon me. And uh, I was a drug addict, alcoholic, and uh, rightfully so, I did have the, the kind of fear that I was going to be punished. Um, but then one day I was in, in a, a bad situation in my life, and I cried out to God. And I said, Lord, I can't do this on my own. Please send me somebody else that will help me. And it, it, was, it was a girl. I was, I was praying for a girl to be in my life, one that already knew him and knew the things of the Bible that would pray with me and, and help me to learn the things of the Bible. And that was my wife, Gina, who went to be with the Lord just over a couple years ago. But um, in that relationship, I, I kept telling her, hey, I'm going to, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll go to church. She used to say, I want to go to church Sunday. And I said, okay, okay, we'll go. But every Sunday would come around and I'd start drinking and using. And well, we got in a big fight one day and I got arrested for pulling her hair, she said, to the cops. And the cops said, well, we're going to get you some help. And when I, when I went to the courthouse, the judge says, some of the local churches have domestic violence classes you can go to. And he seemed to be pointing right at Hosanna. And I remember there was some of my friends had already been coming here for that same situation. And so I started coming to Hosanna through the uh, domestic violence, anger management classes, the ministry that we have here. And in that, I also had uh, uh, had been drinking at the time. So they gave me um, AA classes that I had to go to, which they have here at the most excellent way. And also at the Lion's Den in uh, Paramount. I was, it's a biblical recovery meeting also that I'm still going to. And I started learning the things of the Bible. They introduced me to Jesus and the things of the Bible. And I learned that I, I know that everybody's a sinner, but also that there is forgiveness. And that if I don't believe that there is forgiveness, then I'm calling God a liar. And that really touched me. That was at a, a men's retreat. And uh, Pastor John did the, did the study on that. And it finally it clicked in me. I was forgiven and that no longer I had to live my life with the wrath of God upon me, but in his love. Hi, um, my name's George. Um, since I was a kid, I've always believed in God. And it wasn't until a little bit later that maybe about 16, when I started reading his word more, getting more into the word. Um, I want to just... You know, quote from uh, Acts two seventeen, um, where it says, "And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams." Um, I really believe this is true because in uh, December of twenty fourteen, I. I fell asleep and I just had a strange dream. I had a dr uh, dream that I was uh, surrounded uh, by police officers and I was scared and I was like running in the dream and then suddenly I was uh, placed on high in this dream. I know it sounds strange, but this is the dream that I had and, uh, and I was placed on high and I remember just looking around and it was like clouds and it looked peaceful and I, I didn't know what to, what to, what to make of it. Um, and I was, I was working full time on this time and I was taking care of my mother and, um, my sister and I was the only one working at this time. And, um, uh, my neighbor, he started, uh, abusing drugs and he started becoming really aggressive and he'd come over and, uh, kind of harass my mom when I wasn't home. And I didn't really know about it too much uh, until my sister told me that he would, like, yell things about the parking and stuff like that. Um, so one day he was really uh, intoxicated. And I was at work, and uh, I guess he came over, and he had a, a machete. And, um, you know, he was trying to attack them. And... Um, I was at work, and I just told them, you know, hey, call the cops. So the cops stopped by twice, and I don't know what, 
I don't know what happened. For whatever reason, they weren't able to take care of the situation. Um, you know, the police officers came and they're like, yeah, we know we know this guy. This guy, he's, he's a troublemaker, they told me. Do you want to press charges? And I said, no, just tell him to stay away from my family. You know, I don't, I don't want... I don't want any trouble. Just tell him to stay away from my family. So um, they took him in that day for being intoxicated. Well, um, later on, maybe about a week later, I had another strange dream. I had a dream that I was in, in a court and it was just weird. So um, I, you know, f- that must have been about February now, the the whole fight thing. And then about May, suddenly... Um, you know, all these cops come to my house and they arrest me and I'm like, well, what's, you know, what's going on and stuff. And, um, and I guess, you know, he had said that, um, he added some details of, to the story that weren't true. And, um, you know, he was accusing me of, uh, several things and he made it seem like he was just walking on the street with a machete and I just attacked him for no reason. Um, you know, and I, and I was, I was scared because, you know, I was in jail and I was like, well, I I don't think I deserve this, you know, and my family bailed me out. I went to court. They were like, oh, there's, there's no charges. There's nothing here. Um, you know, you're good to go home, you know? And, uh, yeah, I was, I was home about two weeks later and then they arrested me again and they're like, oh, you never showed up to court. And I was like, I did show up to court. I have paperwork. And they, so they, I was in jail again. And again, I had a, I had a strange dream. I had a dream that, you know, I was going to be going through this stuff and, um, that ultimately God was gonna, gonna help me. I know it sounds strange, but it, it, that's what I was dreaming. I was dreaming that, um, I was dreaming that someone was telling me like, Hey, it's going to be okay. You're going to get out of this. It's, it's going to be okay. Um, and, um, I had been praying to God specifically that I never wanted to go back to jail again. And I was praying, praying, and praying. And as the young lady earlier had said, you know, uh, if you pray and you believe, then you shall receive. And, um, yeah, I mean, um, ultimately they ended up giving me uh, a, a deal. And they said, no more jail time, but you're you know, going to take some anger management and stuff and do community service and stuff. But it beats 13 years. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> you know, and... I'm glad that, you know, God cleared my name through all of that. And that he, you know, as, as I was going through all this stuff, um, you know, he was speaking to me in my dreams. I know as crazy as it sounds as, you know, but that's exactly what was happening. And, um, yeah, I would, as people were sharing right now, I felt like it wouldn't be fair to God for, you know, for me not to share that because, that was truly a blessing in itself, you know, to have even his own family, you know, uh, to put that into their hearts to, to say the truth, you know, that that was big. That was mm. big for me. Yeah. Thank you. Amazing, isn't it? I mean, God, God's grace is sufficient to meet all of our needs. And uh, the primary need, I think, that uh, that is uh, so present in our life when we get saved, is that peace that passes all understanding because there is hope. And that changes everything. And uh, it's constantly a process. I, one person described it as, a, I think, a roller coaster. And we've all been on that ride and are going on it constantly. Uh, but it's the hope, the assurance that you have in Christ of his buckling you up in a sense of his safety, his provisions, his guidance, and his wisdom. And that one day you will see him face to face in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. And all of it will make sense. Because we see this whole world at like the backside of a tapestry. And all the loose strings and loose ends and things that just don't make sense. But then we'll see him face to face and we'll look back at our life and see this beautiful, beautiful poetry that he's made out of our lives. With a purpose and a plan uh, for our life to be able to affect other people's lives and to bring them to Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your, your blessings, your encouragement. We thank you for Hosanna and the opportunity that we have to share together, to minister to one another, and to reach out beyond uh, this community to the community around us and, and uh, touch people's lives for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the very work of your spirit on an individual basis because you meet each one of us right where we're at, when we need it, 
uh, in a way that we can comprehend, we can deal with and go forward. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful, marvelous work for us to see and, and uh, appreciate in each other's lives, Lord, that none of us are isolated or an island to ourselves. We all uh, have that humanity in us and a part of our lives and that struggle, uh, that, that place that we need to call out to you and say, Lord, I can't do it and I cast all my cares on you because you care for me. We thank you, Lord, that you bear that burden. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Well, I pray that the Lord would bless you, bless you and encourage you, enrich you in his love. And if you're going through that part of the roller coaster of uh, depression or despair, uh, reach out to the Lord. Uh, walk on that glass bridge, if you will. Uh, God is able to support you. He will get you through. He will encourage you. He, it will all work together for good uh, because you love the Lord and you are called according to his purpose. May you be filled with his grace and his love. And as was pointed out, he will complete the good work that he's begun in you until the day of Jesus Christ. God bless you.